Let me uh, let me wait just a minute or two to see if we get any more of our members uh, logged on. I'll start in a few minutes. Mr. Mensa? Yes. Uh, can I say something really quick to uh, Officer Sanchez? Certainly. Uh, Officer Sanchez, you're going to be doing a report on the IME? Uh, yes, sir. I'm going to be uh, providing a, a brief overview on IMR 14 and IMR 15. Okay. Um, what I want to let you know, I don't know if you're aware of this. I, I write a, a, a blog. And for four years, I've been actually reporting on the IME reports. And uh, I have uh, written 52 articles on the uh, independent monitors reports. And the reason why I'm letting you know this is that um, uh, I send those articles to all the APD staff, the, the brass and whatever. But what very few people are not aware of I actually send them to the judge, all those reports. And uh, for the last three years now, uh, what I found out is that he actually dockets those reports on the court in the court filings. And I, 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 uh, I'm not sure you are aware of that, but uh, uh, so I would, I do, you may wanna go to the blog that lists, uh, I do have an article that lists virtually every one of my articles. And uh, I was able to confirm to the U.S. Attorney's Office that what the judge does, he reads my reports, and then he makes them part of the docket, which is part of the public record. And that, that's just to let you know what, I'm not sure if you were aware of that. That's all okay, I need. No. Thank you, Mr. Dale. I appreciate that information. So um, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, um, to all our viewers out there, I'd like to thank you all for attending. Um, we always are happy to have you attend our uh, monthly CPC meetings and uh, we encourage you to uh, invite your friends and neighbors uh, to future meetings. Um, we'll talk a little bit later on about what we're planning to do in July. Uh, so, uh, I'll go ahead and introduce myself. I'm Roy Turpin, um, one of the co-chairs of the Northeast Heights uh, Community Policing Council. Uh, I'm a retired uh, city of Albuquerque employee. I worked for 25 years for the city. Uh, my first 22 years of those 25 years were spent working for APD. Um, and then I uh, moved on to uh, be the Deputy Director of Family and Community Services Department before retiring. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce the council as they're tiled on my screen uh, so that they can introduce themselves. And uh, first one up, uh, Vicki, if you would uh, introduce yourself. Certainly, thanks, Roy. Welcome everyone, my name is Vicki Williams. Um, I am a retired Sandia employee and uh, I was a technical project manager for them for 30 years. Um, I've been in Albuquerque for about 34 years. Um, I joined the Community Policing Council after I went to the Citizens Police Academy in 2017, um, looking to make a change, make a difference in the community and the trust between APD and the community members uh, for a safer Albuquerque. Thank you, Vicki. Um, Willie? Hi, everybody. I'm Willie Orr. I'm a retired geriatrician. I've been on the committee oh, for a little over a year now. Um, and, um, and I joined primarily because when systems don't work, um, it's usually not the people involved, it's the system itself. And um, I joined because I wanted to help uh, figure out how we can make um, APD work better with the community um, and work and have more trust in, uh, in the community and be able to do their job well. So that's why I'm here. Thank you. Thanks, Willie. Uh, James? 
Hi there. Good evening, everybody. My name is James. I'm uh, James Santa Stephen, a business owner here in the city of Albuquerque and native. I own Zia Auto Repair and Zia Auto Sales, and we're in our 32nd year of business, homeowner and property owner, and just trying to make uh, Albuquerque a safer um, city and a voice of the community. Thank you. Thanks, James. Uh, Rick? Hi, my name is Rick Lujan. I'm uh, a homeowner in the Northeast Heights in Candelaria and uh, Carlisle. And I joined CPC to be able to help promote my uh, neighborhood association and to strengthen the bond between uh, the community and APD. And also to try to uh, help our neighbors uh, reduce crime, to report crime, and to understand uh, how, uh, especially like community uh, safety council is working. Uh, reported it a few times and it's working beautifully. So glad to be here. Thank you, Rick. Uh, Cassandra? Good evening, everyone. My name is Cassandra Morrison. I'm a retired sergeant from the Albuquerque Police Department. Thank you, Cassandra. Um, and as a realtor with Coldwell Banker Legacy, Louisiana. Having a little trouble with your audio, uh, Cassandra. I missed part of that, but thank you for being here, as always. Uh, Lieutenant uh, Sanchez, uh, we were actually going to have you, uh, uh, we had. Uh, a presentation of the IMR scheduled for July. So it, it's actually good that uh, in a way that you're here this evening and uh, we welcome you uh, and uh, look forward to your presentation on uh, IMR 14 and 15. So the floor is yours, uh, Lieutenant. All right, great. Let me see if I can, uh, do I have the ability to share a screen so that you all can see? I think I do. Kelly, can you make that happen? Thank you. Okay, can you all see that there? Yes. Okay, great. So yeah, as uh, as has been introduced, my name is Jason Sanchez. I'm currently acting as the commander for the Compliance and Oversight um, Division. So I want to give you all a brief overview of the settlement agreement, where we're at today, and some of the progress, and highlight some of the progress and some of the work that we still need to be done, um, you know, for the uh, through, throughout the CASA. So um, as you all know. Um, we have an independent monitoring team and it's compi comprised of these individuals. Um, uh, the monitoring team is headed by Dr. James Ginger, um, who works closely with Mr. Phil Coyne, Dan Giaquinto, Laura Kennard, Rick Nasalis, Albert Pryke, um, Steve Rickman, Billy Toms, and Mr. David Torres. Um, each of these monitors have specific areas within the settlement agreement that they um, um, closely uh, work and communicate with, a, uh, with APD um, on. A lot of the things that we're going to talk about today can be found in these links here, and I can provide that to uh, uh, there at the end of the presentation. But, you know, we're going to be, we're going to be talking about the, uh, like I said, the uh, IMR 14. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on IMR 14 because that's more of an antiquated uh, report. I do want to talk about 15 um, primarily, and then we will uh, kind of go from there. So what this slide uh, kind of highlights is, talks about this, the, the, the cost as a whole. So we have um, several different sections that make up the settlement agreement. You have your use of force paragraphs that comprise of all the requirements that um, the police officers are under to report and to, and how to utilize force. You know, it, it outlines those requirements, those, those initiatives. Um, it has sections relating to specialized units, such as our tactical teams. Um, we have sections within the settlement agreement that deal specifically with crisis intervention and those individuals that are some suffering from um, mental illness. We have, uh, you know, so on and so forth. We had, and I don't want to belabor the point and go through each bullet point, but just to give you a broad overview about the cost is very broad. It has a lot of different, um, a lot of different areas within the police department that it does touch. So, 
On the box to the right, you'll see that there's 340, when you look at this cost as a whole, you have 344 paragraphs um, that are within the settlement agreement. The important part to note is that 276 of these of the 344 paragraphs are measurable, um, have measurable components um, that the monitoring team that I highlighted earlier basically grade us on. So there are three levels of compliance that we all um, uh, are aware are aware of. So you have your primary compliance, you have secondary compliance, and you have operational compliance. Now, operational compliance is what we're trying to achieve as a department. Um, Operational compliance basically means that not only do you have policies and procedures in place, but those policies are uh, those policies and procedures are trained and it's part of the daily operation within the department. It's a cultural, it's it's a uh, it's it's something that's now embedded in the culture of APD. Um, and again, if anybody has any questions, um, just go ahead and stop me and uh, and we can answer that, or we can also save time for the end. So this particular um, bar graph kind of is interesting because it shows a lot of, kind of it tells a story a little bit about um, how APD has trended with the settlement agreement. So as I mentioned, an, an independent monitor report is basically a report card that the monitor gives um, that highlights the areas that we need improvement as well as the areas where we are making improvement within the department. So you'll see that throughout uh, throughout the first IMR all the way to IMR 15, um, you have different levels of compliance. So you'll see in IMR 14 and 15, we obviously we have we have policies in place for every section within the CASA. Um, those are policies that are in place that are being treated at a uh, that are being uh, um, uh, that are that have made their way into our special special orders or uh, or SOPs for that matter. Um, the other important thing to note is that you'll see in IMR 15 is a big jump in secondary compliance. So we were at 82% in secondary compliance. We had a big jump of 99% of the settlement of those uh, 276 paragraphs are now in secondary compliance, which is, which is great news. And then we also had, we saw, you can see that we see a jump from 62% in IMR 15 to 70% in operational compliance. So we'll get into this a little bit more as this presentation goes on, but I just kind of want to draw, draw your attention to just uh, this bar graph and kind of tells a story over time. So I want to, again, talk a little bit about IMR 14. The reason I want to talk about IMR 14 is because um, I don't think you all had a, had a presentation um, the last reporting period. So I want to make sure that we're all on the same sheet of music when it comes to IMR 14. Uh, we saw that we, we were still in 100% compliance area for when it relates to primary compliance levels. Um, we had a sec we had a secondary compliance score of 82%, which means 82% of our paragraphs were in secondary compliance, and then we um, kind of were around there, a measly 62% for operational compliance. We didn't see a big jump from IMR 13 from the previous um, settlement agreement. So, having said that, uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, this particular um, slide. This is a, a kind of a it has some interesting information. So. What I mentioned earlier, we have the different sections within the settlement agreement. And what this slide is supposed is hopefully designed to kind of highlight is some of those sections. Um, so we have our use of force policies. Um, we see that there was 91% in IMR 14 of use of force policies that we didn't see any change in compliance levels. They basically stayed where they were at, whether they were in um, primary or secondary, you know. And we saw a decrease of about 1% in our use of force paragraphs. There was one paragraph that we actually we saw in IMR 14 that actually decreased um, in compliance levels, which is um, which right was raises a flag with the department. We need to you know determine why what happened with that pair you know with that particular paragraph. And again, I don't want to go through each particular um, pie chart, but uh, that's kind of what we're at there. You will see the crisis intervention, which is a uh, which is a which oops, let me see if I can go back. I apologize. The crisis invention, we also had one paragraph that had a decrease in compliance, but we had 92% that there was no change. And then we had 4% that we actually saw an increase um, in compliance levels. Um, again, a little bit of the, some of the same information. We're talking about staffing management, um, our misconduct, 
uh, sections, as well as the recruitment, selection, promotions areas of the CASA. Uh, tells a little bit of the story there. And then our community engagement um, paragraph. And uh, let's see what else. I'm just trying to move. And then our implementation, uh, the assessment and enforcement, you know, we didn't have any that were that decreased there. Um, the interesting with the community engagement, you all might be wondering what was the paragraph that actually decreased in compliance. And if I'm not mistaken, that was a CPC paragraph. That was again because we didn't, as a department, share this information with you all. So it caused us to go into uh, uh, in, into secondary compliance. You know, so we 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 had lost that that particular paragraph. Um, we saw that change um, in IMR 14. But you know, now more recently, this is probably um, the more up-to-date IMR. So we see a huge jump um, here. We see that we have 99% of our paragraphs are in secondary compliance and a about an 8% jump from the previous IMR into operational compliance. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the reasons for that here at the end. Again, this kind of just shows what I demonstrated in the previous, um, the previous slides with the post pie charts. Um, we can see the use of force looks a lot different. We see that there was a, a, a huge number in increased compliance levels with our use of force paragraphs. Um, you know, we had 29 paragraphs that jumped into the increase in compliance in compliance ratings. Um, and then we have uh, recruitment selection promotion that also at, that was. Uh, we didn't have any change in compliance on those ones. Um, we did see a jump in, in compliance levels with our misconduct complaint intake process and any of those investigations and education dealing with those paragraphs. And, um, and actually I apologize. Uh, the IMR 15 that I'm talking about is going to be the, uh, when, when I talked about community engagement, that actually is gonna be Regarding, I, that's gonna that would have been reported in IMR fifteen actually about the CPCs, um, so that was that was a reason that was the reason why uh, we saw that this one decreased in compliance was because IMR fourteen was not presented. So I apologize for the confusion there. A um, couple of things that I do want to just highlight is that. Um, we did see some huge increases from 62% to 70% operational. And these were some very important paragraphs for the department, for the community as a whole. Um, a lot of this was related to our, our OBRD policies and we were able to really put forth a big training um, push for the, you know, throughout the department. So I think that was really attributed to the huge jump in, in compliance levels that we saw. This is the highest overall, um, these are the highest levels of overall compliance that we as a department and as a community have experienced, you know, since the monitoring team has been here. So I think we are trending in the right direction. Um, one of the things I do want to also just make sure that you all know uh, is our EFIT team. That's the um, external force investigated team that I'm sure you all are familiar with. They are still in place. Um, I wanted to highlight that cases are still being investigated. They're being investigated in a timely manner. And the quality investigations have significantly improved since their um, uh, since their tenure here in with, with with APD. So with that, I'll turn it over to the rest of the uh, the council and see if I can field any questions for you all. Okay, thank you, Lieutenant, uh, for your presentation. Um, yes, yeah, so it look it looks like we have a couple questions in the chat so far, um, which I will be managing this evening. Um, <clears throat> So, Commander Sanchez, what are the two biggest hurdles to getting to 100% operational compliance? Okay, well, I would say one of, the, one of the biggest hurdles that we're going to have is going to obviously have to still deal with use of force investigations. Um, we as a department are trying to change, making sure that we have the proper policies that are in place that are trainable so that anyone who assumes a role within the Internal Affairs Force Division has the tools necessary to succeed. So I would say that would probably be one of the biggest hurdles that we as a department and as a community are still facing is just the use of force investigations. But having said that, the fact that EFIT is still, you know, is here, they are, they are taking a close, um, you know, they are working closely with the APD detectives. 
it's going to be a matter of continuing that momentum once EFIT leaves um, to be able to maintain that. So that's what I uh, what I would say would be one of the biggest hurdles that we as a department um, have to make sure that we're improving in those force investigations. But not only do we improve, but do we maintain the same uh, same quality of rigorous investigations for force uh, force investigations. And <clears throat> excuse me. And does APD have like a timeline for compliance? I mean, have you talked about okay, you know, here's how we get to you know, 80% operational, 90% operational, and by year 20 XX, we should be in compliance. Yeah, so no, that's a great question, Ms. Williams. Thank you for that. Um, the chief, if you all have may have seen in the past, uh, probably two weeks, I want to say, um, has said his goal is to be operational within two years. So it's what we're expecting is by IMR 18, we want to be fully operational. Um, and that is a, that is a very... Um, that's a very aggressive, and, and again, I say two years before two years, you know, within two years, um, that is a very aggressive time frame, you know, and that is something that I think we can accomplish, but it's taking, um, it's taking APD to work very closely with the monitor, to have regular meetings with them, which we are doing. We have started um, some great initiatives on the compliance side to really foster, um, to really hammer home and make sure that we are hitting those timelines, that strategic plan of um, being operational compliance by IMR 18. One of those initiatives is called uh, reform stat, which means that we are bringing, um, we are bringing uh, representatives from APD that are overseeing certain paragraphs within the settlement agreement. And we're identifying them at an executive level. You know, we're having meetings with them on a weekly basis to talk about um, where they might be stalling you know, where, what issues might be coming up that needs to be escalated up to a deputy chief level, to the chief of police, or bring in other city entities to kind of catapult that uh, progression forward. So um, I hope that answered your question. Um, yes, thank okay. you. Um, I have a, a question, uh, Lieutenant. Do you know if the EFIT, uh, the new EFIT contract has been signed? Yeah, so we are set to, uh, it's, it's, yes. Um, the new EFIT contract is going to be what Mr. Turpin is referring to is going to be um, a secondary group of EFIT detectives that are going to be handling the, uh, the backlog of force cases that occur um, during the year of 2020. So, in fact, I am slated to present to that new team, I think it's uh, June 17th, um, to those EFIT investigators, kind of give them an overview of the settlement agreement and make sure that they're trained up and they understand uh, the different policies and special orders that existed at the time so that those investigations can be looked at in that in that same lens. Okay, thank you. Uh, Willie, you have your hand up. There we go. Yes, thanks. All right, so speaking of EFIT, I, I'm, I'm very pleased to see that you got the, the EFIT team got all the current cases um, was all over the last quarter. That's a great step forward. You did not increase the backlog. Um, my concern is, which you touched on, I'd like you to go into more detail, is when EFIT does leave, are you going to have the staff and the capabilities so you don't get in the 667 backlog again that you were currently? Um, because it sounds like you're having, with the increased staff, you're able to keep up. Uh, but then if it's outside and they will leave and are you going to be able to keep up uh, so we don't fall in this hole again? Yeah, I think so. I think that's a great question. Uh, Mr. Orr, I, the, uh, um, when, bef when that 667 cases, when those, when those, when those cases during that time, the infrastructure of the internal affairs force division was much different than what it, what, what it is now. In, and what I mean by that is we have, at least three to four deputy commanders within the force division um, that are in existence now that weren't in existence in 2020, if that makes sense. So why that's important is that because there is a level of executive oversight uh, that is happening now that was not occurring in 2020. Um, there is weekly meetings th that are occurring um, to make sure that investigators are having, uh, that sergeants are meeting with their investigators on a regular basis. Um, on a weekly basis, and real, the supervisors, the sergeants, are the ones that are really immersed in the case with the detective. 
So having I say that because there is it's it is it is staffed now more than what it's ever been, and I would be shocked if there would be another um, another backlog under these you know unless the staffing right changes. We don't know what happens in the future, but APD is committed to it. Chief Medina has been very committed to making sure that IFD is a priority with the department. Thank you. Um, may I Mr. Ask Din Mr. Dinelli, you uh, have a co couple of questions. If I may, uh, Lieutenant Sanchez, first of all, I wanna commend APD for an exceptional job being able to make such progress the last uh, monitor's report. The monitor, though, though uh, you talked about Chief Medina saying he wants to get into compliance in two years. Is that correct? Yeah, he, it's, it's before two years. I'll have to actually look at what the article said, but yeah, it's by IMR 18. Okay, that's two years. But once that happens, this, uh, the uh, CASA still has to remain in effect for two more years. Is that correct? Yeah, so we, they have to make sure that we're in operational compliance and we maintain operational compliance. So at the bare minimum, we're looking at four years before we can say goodbye to the Department of Justice. Um, yeah. Okay. One of the things that bothered me the most in this last report, though, that stuck out to me anyway, is that the uh, monitor said the weak points of APD's compliance efforts remain the same as they were in the past. Supervisors and mid-level command personnel continue to be the weak link when it comes to holding officers accountable for their infield behavior. Until that issue is resolved, further increases in APD's compliance level levels will be difficult to attain. And uh, I think you yourself pointed out that operational compliance we're at 70, 70%, but if we're still having problems with the men management, don't you think that it's gonna be difficult to get to that 100% or that 95% level? Yes, so Mr. Dillon, I think that's a great question. Again, that was, we have made great strides since IMR 15 has been written. In fact, we are coming on the heels of a recent monitor visit um, where I think overall um, the tone and tenure from the monitoring leaving, um, you know, leaving this past week was favorable saying, hey, you all are making great strides in supervision and the components that you're talking about, Mr. Nelly. And I'll highlight one component that we are doing that well, we're in a better spot than what we were last IMR 15 to address that particular issue. And that is gonna be our performance evaluation management system. What we have now in place is basically a, a process and a policy that has been trained upon to really immerse the first line supervisors in the actions of the officers. So if an officer is identified as, hey, this, per this officer might have a problem with, you know, you know, maybe he comes to the event with, and he, again, it's using data. You know, th this officer needs a call in for the supervisor to do something. Um, the supervisor is gonna be there to mentor, to help, to counsel, to do what he needs to do to be a supervisor, to make sure that officer is, um, you know, it's successful and has a long career with APD. Now, if that does not go through, you know, we have certain um, backstops in place so that it can be escalated um, so that either a lieutenant can then now hold the sergeant accountable for not identifying that officer. If the lieutenant does not find that, then it goes up to the command, up to the deputy chiefs, basically. So I think we're in a much better place than when the IMR 15 was drafted. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm prefacing my comments a lot on the, the positive um, tenor, the positive tone that when the monitor left this past week. And that's very fair. Uh, and again, I, the progress you've made. Now, when the uh, 15th report came out, I was extremely optimistic. And then the effort report came out. It was as if we took two steps forward and two steps back. What bothered me with the effort report is they, they came out and said that, uh, and I'll read this, most significantly, 102 out of 229 or 44% of the use of force investigations closed by effort and the internal affairs force division were found to be out of compliance when evaluated against the process narrative utilized. Later on in the report, they also 
pointed out, the EFIT pointed out, in August, they're expecting a huge departure of experienced officers within the Internal Affairs Division, that is, who are doing the, the EFIT. So I'd like you to respond to both those points, if you could. Do you feel progress has been made to reverse this trend of not being in compliance with the, uh, with the uh, uh, internal affairs, uh, that is internal uh, uh, use of force investigations and what efforts are being made to be able to hire more people come August to avoid this mass, uh, they're, leaving, they're leaving in droves is what the words, uh, is, is the words I would use. Okay, well, I'm not aware of, I'm not aware, we, so we had that strong civilian component that is, is, part, of, is part of IFD now. Um, I don't have the numbers in front of me and how many civilian investigators that we do have. 25. Now, obviously, what's that now? You're supposed to have 25. Yeah, we have, yes, we have 25. Down, I think you're down to 50. I don't know how many, civil, how many of the 25 make up the civilian component, if that makes sense. So I'd have to I'd have to go back and um, communicate with uh, the, uh, the the commander of IFD, but I can say that the having the civilian I think helps because um, you know they have tested for that position, they have applied for that position, and there's not if, no matter where you go within the department, there is always a risk of uh, an officer saying, hey, you know what, I want to go work in a SWAT team because there's an op there's an opportunity there, or I want to go work as a detective in a homicide unit. Um, that's one of the risks when you have it as an officer that's working as a detective that they, you can potentially leave at any point. Now, there are certain parameters in place where we do have now um, a commitment when you do sign on to the enforced investigation team as a detective, um, as a sworn officer to work there, you're committing for a minimum um, time requirement to work there. Um, the other thing is, again, like I highlighted earlier with the, the civilian component, um, we won't. We don't typically see, uh, and I and I, I refer to them as civilians, but I'm actually going to refer to them probably a proper name as professional staff. Our professional staff of individuals that we have there don't readily move um, from different sections within the division or within the department as readily. And um, so, yeah. So I'm not sure if that's answering your question, Mr. Dinelli, but I can tell you that you know one of we try to think. That's always staffing is always a concern from the chief of police to even a sergeant that's working the field, you know, well, it, it's a concern. The, the effort report also pointed out there were no incentives to try to keep people like they did with other di the divisions within the APD. And uh, they really raised an alarm that they feel that they're gonna lose so many that they're not gonna be able to, uh, to keep up. And that's, I'm only gonna make that point. You don't have to respond to that, uh, respond to that as a question. But I'd like to know of the of the backlog of cases that were originally reported. Uh, uh, I forget what the number was. Uh, Six hundred sixty-seven. Have those been cleared out? No, those those. So it's not growing any longer. They will start. EFIT will start working on those six hundred sixty-seven cases. I think it's June seventeenth or there around at the middle part of June. They haven't even started though. No, sir. Correct. Okay. Um. I have nothing else. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pete. Uh, do we have any other questions in the chat, Vicki, for Lieutenant? Uh, no, no, we don't, Roy. Okay. Uh, Lieutenant, I really appreciate you coming and um, giving us this presentation. Um, it, it, uh, it's very enlightening, and I thank you for taking your time to spend some time with us this evening. So. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you all for your time and you all have a good evening. You bet. Um, before I introduce uh, uh, our speaker, I neglected to take care of a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, uh, namely, uh, we need to amend and, and approve uh, the June agenda tonight's meeting. So do I have a motion? I'll make a motion to approve. Motion and a second. Motion and second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And also to uh, amend and approve the uh, May meeting minutes. So I'll make motion. a motion. Motion. Second. second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, tonight, um, we have uh, Pete Danelli. 
um, who's going to be making a presentation on a couple of uh, areas uh, that uh, he's covered in uh, his blog. Um, I, I want to. Can you hear uh, me? Can yeah. you hear me? Yeah. I just lost everything. I need to, I'm, I'm going to have to check out and check back in. Okay. I, I'm, I'm, well, if you can hear me, that's fine. And I'll, I'll just talk without uh, picture. Okay. I, um, I will, in, in, in the sake of brevity, Pete, um, um, I, I will uh, give a brief introduction and then turn it over to you. I just wanted to highlight that uh, uh, Pete has been a practicing attorney in New Mexico since uh, 1978. Um, he spent 27 years in municipal and uh, uh, state government service. Um, more importantly to uh, what we're doing here, uh, Pete worked uh, at the city um, starting as a deputy city attorney and moving up to uh, chief public safety officer, which uh, at that time he oversaw the uh, police department, the fire department, and the uh, 911 communication center. So um, Pete is no, um, Pete is very familiar with uh, the goings on. Um, in law enforcement in Albuquerque. And um, Pete, without further ado, I will turn the floor over to you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, as I said, I'm at somewhat at a disadvantage. My uh, video completely went out, and I don't know if you can even see me. Yeah, I can see you. We can okay. see you, Pete. Uh, so, uh, but I'm at a disadvantage. I can't see you now. Uh, I was asked to talk about, uh, did you want me to talk about the- uh, Both, uh, if you could touch a little bit on um, the EFIT um, stuff uh, that we were originally uh, gonna talk about. Uh, I asked Pete to expand his presentation uh, based on a recent blog art article that he wrote uh, regarding the uh, homeless uh, situation in Albuquerque and the uh, safe, uh, safe places uh, that uh, the uh, city wants to provide, uh, I believe uh, a total of up to possibly 18 in the city. So um, if you could uh, just kind of take it from there, Pete. Very good. Um, as I pointed out earlier, uh, I have a, a blog, which I try to write an article every day, and I've written roughly 52 articles on the uh, independent uh, federal monitors reports, as well as the IFET reports. And um, I was extremely uh, excited when I saw that there was such dramatic improvement when it came to the 15th federal monitors report. Uh, as the uh, Lieutenant had pointed out earlier, there has been a significant increase in the amount of compliance levels relating to uh, the three compliance levels that are that uh, that are mandated. Uh, primary compliance is now at 100%. It's been there for some time now. It's the secondary compliance level that uh, really increased dramatically. It went to 99%. Operational compliance is now at 70%. Uh, the point is, is with the operational compliance level, that is the single hardest compliance level to achieve. And as I uh, try to point out, uh, when APD receives a 95 compliance rate in all three of those compliance levels and maintains that for two consecutive years, the court approved settlement agreement can be dismissed. What bothered me about uh, the federal monitor's report and what stuck out to me was, is that uh, when the federal monitor tempered his remarks uh, regarding the extent of uh, progress that had been made under the, uh, under the 15th report, this is what he said. The weak points of APD's compliance efforts remain the same as they were in previous reports. Supervisors and mid-level command personnel continue to be the weak link when it comes to holding officers accountable for their infield behavior. Until that issue is resolved, 
further increases in APD compliance levels will be difficult to attain. So although they're at 70% compliance in the third compliance level, what, is, what cannot be overemphasized uh, is that 30% is gonna be the hardest, bring it up to the 95% level to allow the dismissal. And uh, it gets back to, it's the mid management that is gonna have to really be monitored or really be uh, uh, motivated to come into compliance. Now, uh, when the federal monitor released his 15th report, Chief Medina, in fact, uh, was quick to take credit for it uh, with the latest improvements. He then, as the sergeant, as the lieutenant pointed out, he then set the goal that he wanted to, uh, to come into complete compliance within two years. In other words, try to get all three compliance levels to 95% or more. Once that occurs, then APD has to maintain that for a two year period. So we're looking at roughly four more years of at, at the best case scenario, four more years in which the, uh, in which the uh, uh, court approved settlement agreement will be enforced and four more years of having to deal with, uh, uh, with the federal monitor. Now on May 16th of this year, the external force investigation team filed with the federal court its quarterly report. What was troubling is that the, it was as if we made a lot of progress in one area, but when it came to the effort, there was very little progress made. Uh, the effort found that of 100, uh, uh, found that of 102 of 229 uh, AP use of force investigations, or 44% were out of compliance. In other words, they were not following the, the policies. EFFET also reported that as of April 22nd, uh, the Internal Force Division responded to open investigations and they opened roughly 3,674 use of force incident cases to review. What EFFET did say is that it had serious concerns with the manner in which the Internal Affairs and Force Division first line supervisors, who are the sergeants and lieutenants, are handling the daily supervision of the detectives in the division. Effort went on to find that it believed that it, that it was clearly a first line supervisor issue that if it left uncorrected, it will continue to render investigations out of compliance with the uh, process narrative. So the point I'm trying to raise is that although significant progress has been made with uh, coming into compliance, the effort team is reporting that they're, they're having difficulty in uh, keeping up the level of scrutiny to make sure that these uh, uh, excessive use of force cases are handled appropriately. What the uh, federal monitor also said was that what remains to be done is to focus on APD sergeants and lieutenants and commanders to ensure that APD's major compliance systems are CASA congruent and reflective of the department established oversight and use of force policies. What this gets down to is that they have to make sure that the day-to-day -day delivery of CASA compliance services are in fact being achieved. And uh, the point being is that the effort, although it's making progress, what is disappointing is that we have known now for what, roughly four months that uh, the, the, there's been this huge backlog of cases. Point is they haven't even started to look into those 661 odd cases. Uh, and a lot of it has to do the fact that they have yet to file or sign the contract. At least that was the last information that I had uh, that hopefully has changed. But the sooner that they get started on that, on those, uh, that backlog, the sooner that they're gonna be able to make progress. The Department of Justice have made it very clear they do, they do want those investigations to be completed and they need to do so as quickly as possible. Uh, I don't know, uh, uh, another area of concern, uh, they talked about the use of force investigations that were closed. Uh, as of the last effort report, 21 out of 229 of those reports, or 917 use of force investigations that were closed, uh, were found uh, not to be within the APD use of force policies. Um, and as I said, that uh, 102 out of 229 of the use of force investigations closed by EFFET and the Internal Affairs Division were found to be out of compliance. 
and which were evaluated against the uh, uh, process narrative. Um, I don't want to belabor this because I, I, I want to talk about that other topic, uh, Roy, but I'll try to answer any questions regarding the effort report if you'd like. Okay. Does anyone have any questions? Do we have any questions on, uh, regarding the ether in the chat, Vicki? Uh, no, we don't, Roy. Okay. Okay, Pete, if you want to transition, this might be a good time. Pete, can you, uh, well, we lost Pete. He's there back. you are. You're back, Pete. Was I cut off? Yeah, you, you faded away and now you're back. So this might be a good a good point to transition into the homeless uh, safe spaces. What uh, I, I was able to get back on. What what happened? Where where was I cut off? Uh, you finished uh, the EFIT um, okay presentation and, and there were no questions regarding that so um i hope i didn't rush too quickly through that uh, no i think you did a good job of uh summarizing it um, okay um well, the main topic that i had presumed i was going to be talking about regarded uh, uh is in regards to the uh amendments to the zoning code that are occurring and this relates to the uh Safe outdoor spaces. Uh, Excuse me, Mr. Dinelli. We did have one question that came up from um, Willie. Sure. I, I believe he's asking um, what level of policy violations were noted. Okay, let me. Uh, I don't have that off the top of my head. I do recall. Okay, here it goes. This is, and I'll quote the effort. Most significantly, 102 out of the 229, or 44.4% of the use of force investigations closed by effort and the Internal Affairs Force Division were found to be out of compliance when evaluated against the process narrative utilized to assess investigations. It goes on to say, this is an increase of 34% reported in the previous quarterly report. This development must be an obvious concern for the Internal Affairs Division. As of April 22nd, EFIT and the Internal Affairs Force Division responded to and or opened investigations on 3,674 use of force incidents to include 11, 11 officer involved shootings and made three referrals to the multi-agency task force or potential criminal violations. As of this report, 21 out of 229 or 9.17% of the use of force investigations closed by effort and the internal affairs force divisions were found to be not within APD use of force policies. This is a decrease from 10% reported in the previously quarterly report. Okay, thank you. Oh, also, they reported effort in the Internal Affairs Force Division completed 229 investigations with the 90 day time period outlined in the uh, amended stipulated order. I think that answered your question, or did that answer your question? Did that answer your question, Willie? I, I guess so. uh, what I'm interested in, and you may not have the data. Well, first of all, I'm a little confused by the 9.7% and the 44%. Uh, those numbers are different. Um, but, uh, I, 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 you know, they're, I assume they're different levels of policy value uh, violations. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, but I assume that there's I'm making this up a level one, which is they forgot to dot their I or something and level five, which is they're really bad. Um, and, and so I was trying to find out if you had the data on what if they do divide violations up into levels, how the levels divide out. I don't have that information. 
Okay, that's that's that, that's really what I was what I was trying to find out. Okay, thank you. Well, well, we do know that use of force is divided into three levels: level right. one, level two, and level three. But as far as policy violations, I think there's a whole matrix that is looked at when determining violations in specific policies. So I don't right. know if the policy violations cover all of the use of force. I mean, it's kind of like we're talking about apples and oranges with use of force level and then policy violations. It seems right. like, you know, it's a little bit convoluted. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, oh, sorry, yeah. sorry for the interruption, Mr. Dinelli. That's all right. What I had talked to Roy about tonight was a, a discussion of the uh, recent amendment that is before the Albuquerque City Council involving the Integrated Development Ordinance, the short, for, uh, it's referred to as the EDO. And what the EDO is, is the uh, Integrated Development Ordinance that uh, basically was rewritten over a two year period of time where it really covers all zoning and all development in the Albuquerque area. Uh, the uh, number of development zones went from 250 zones in the Albuquerque area to 20. Now, one of the things that we've been dealing with for the last couple of years is a crisis involving the homeless. Okay. And uh, what the city has now come up with, or should I say the Albuquerque Pete, if you can hear us, try to log. as uh, safe outdoor spaces. And uh, what the safe outdoor spaces amendment is, it will allow for the creation of, uh, uh, of designated government sanctioned encampments for the homeless. And uh, it's a pretty dramatic change in policy because in instead of uh, prohibiting any kind of encampments, the city will allow now uh, government sponsored encampments, homeless encampments. And uh, they are basically, uh, like I said, they, they call them uh, the, the safe outdoor spaces. And uh, it's an amendment to the EDO. And uh, what, what the proposed zone change will, will allow are as follows. And again, I'll list what will be allowed. What the city council is proposing is to allow not more than two sanctioned campsites in every single city council district uh, or a total of 18 campsites. And the campsites themselves would be limited, limited to 40 uh, tents, which also would allow for cars and recreational vehicles. Uh, they have actually come up with a map that shows roughly 15% of the city in the various industrial area of the city uh, open space areas of the city where these type of encampments would be allowed. And uh, what would happen is that a property owner, uh, by the way, property ownership is not required. What would happen is that if you wanted to put a homeless encampment, a safe outdoor space encampment, you would apply with the city and receive a zoning change for that. Now, each campsite under the ordinance or under the uh, change in law, each campsite would be required to have a certain number of water flush or composting toilets or portable facilities, hand washing stations and showers based. And this is all be, would be based upon occupancy. It would require a, surround, a, a wall or screen of six feet tall to, in order to, uh, uh, for those that are using tents. Now operators of the campsites would include churches and nonprofit organizations. And they would have to provide to the city a management plan or security agreement provided that there, and also provide for 24 seven onsite support and security. The operators of these campsites would offer occupants some form of social services and support facilities. Uh, the homeless campsites would be prohibited from being allowed within 330 feet of low density residential areas. Religious institutions would have more flexibility for locating them. And the campsites would be permitted in certain commercial business parks and manufacturing zones 
as well as in some mixed use zoning zone areas, but only after public hearing. Now, this is a far cry from what they originally, from another zoning ordinance, they wanted to allow for living lots. And this would be uh, open space areas that would uh, allow for not just tents, but also uh, 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 cars, uh, RVs, all to be used overnight. And it would be done on a first come first served basis. There would be no rules or regulations. The city council backed off on that and now they are centering on uh, just these uh, 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 safe outdoor spaces. And as I said, they intend to allow nine. This has already been approved. They've, uh, they intend to allow uh, two in each of the nine city council districts. Although it's been allowed, what has happened is that the, uh, the uh, integrated development ordinance, it was amended at the last city council meeting. And to be honest with you, I think the city council did something very sneaky. What they did is that they took under consideration upwards of two, upwards of a 100 amendments to the integrated development ordinance. And they put it at the end of the meeting, knowing full well there were quite a few people who wanted to speak out and oppose it. And uh, what they did is they, first at first, the integrated development ordinance failed. Uh, all the amendments went down in flames. One city councilor, though, changed her mind and they went back and they enacted all the amendments, which included the safe outdoor spaces. What is concerning about the integrated development ordinance, it has a major impact on virtually every single area of Albuquerque. The safe, the safe outdoor spaces basically will now allow encampments. Unless the city council go back, goes back and tries to repeal that section, we will be having these uh, 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 safe outdoor spaces by the end of the summer. Now, what the city did not disclose also at this meeting, they're already making plans for what are referred to as, they want to use, utilize these areas for tent cities. And by that, the city intends to go out and buy uh, uniform tents that would be set up and then uh, go ahead and allow people to come in and use those tents, but they would also require background checks or what have you. And there would be limitations on who could use it. Uh, and uh, again, the resources that will be dedicated toward that, uh, the mayor's administration has dedicated $750,000 to develop these uh, safe outdoor spaces. The reason why I feel very strongly about not having these is that the city has already made a tremendous financial investment. Uh, study after study has shown that temporary housing such as this is not the solution to our homeless problem. Uh, the goal of the, what has found to be a real uh, viable solution is providing permanent housing. And by that permanent housing, what I'm talking about, actual structures or shelters that provide the necessary services to assist the homeless. Last year, the city of Albuquerque spent $40 million in uh, contracts to help the homeless, whether it be for vouchers, whether it be for temporary housing. Uh, and they also uh, uh, bought the, uh, uh, the Gibson, Loveless Gibson property, uh, the, the former Loveless Hospital. Uh, we spent $15 million to buy that. This coming year, the city council approved another $60 million, again, to go towards helping of the homeless. One thing I wanna emphasize, this is a very personal issue to me. Uh, and uh, because of a, a family member who uh, was suffering from severe mental illness. I feel very strongly that the city has a moral obligation to help the homeless. But we have to come to the realization that there is a certain percentage of the homeless that refuse, that don't want any help whatsoever. And that's why we have situations like we have with Coronado Park. I don't know if anybody has seen Coronado Park, but this was a, a, a pristine park at one time. And what has happened over the last 10 years, the city has allowed it to basically be used as exclusively as a homeless encampment. encampment. 
<clears throat> at any given time, we have between 80 and 90 tents that have been erected on the property. Every two weeks, the city goes in, forces them out, and cleans up the property to the tune of $27,000. So we're spending well over $52,000 a month just to clean up Coronado, Shop, uh, Coronado, uh, the Coronado Park down, uh, down on 2nd Street. These home, these open, these uh, uh, safe spaces, uh, uh, encampments, to me will result in many, many Coronado parks throughout the city of Albuquerque. I think it's a mistake. And uh, I think the uh, community policing councils, I think they're gonna find themselves with a situation that this will eventually become probably the number one problem that people will be complaining to you about. Why is it that we are uh, going forward with this type of a program. And again, uh, at the next council meeting, which will be on June 22nd, the city council will have an opportunity to revisit the integrated development ordinance and to even go so far as to repeal the, uh, uh, to repeal these uh, uh, safe uh, outdoor spaces. Um, and again, uh, the goal of the city is not just to have the safe outdoor spaces. What they want to do is implement a system of communities of tents. That's what they're calling them, communities of tents, where they will provide an area for them to store their, uh, their belongings and provide a tent and provide a chair or a place to sleep. Uh, the reality of it is that uh, it's not likely that uh, uh, the hardcore homeless are gonna really want anything to do with this. But those that do, that does pose a real problem. So with that, um, I'll open up to any questions that you may have. Um, I'll start off, Pete. Um, do you know, uh, or have you read anything that uh, kind of breaks out the percentage of, of the homeless that you know they're they're homeless at uh, because they want to be uh, they they don't want to follow rules they they want to live free. Um, that uh, that is an excellent question, and I, I I do have information to that effect. Every year, the city of Albuquerque does what is called a point in time survey. It's a mandatory survey where the city, in order to qualify for HUD uh, programs and grants. Uh, the, the, uh, what happens, the survey is done once a year where they go out in January on a one evening and they take an inventory of the number of homeless people in any given area. Uh, the last point in time uh, report was, was uh, 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 um, released in January and it found that roughly there were 1,900 homeless people that were classified as a chronic homeless. Uh, and uh, it's divided into two categories. There's the chronic homeless and the near homeless. Now, when you talk to the providers, uh, whether it be the Albuquerque Public School System or whether it be the, uh, the uh, Hope Works or some of these other providers, and by the way, APS lists roughly, I think the last figure I saw, 3,000 children in the Albuquerque area that list no home, uh, home address. And so they try to argue that they're homeless. Uh, and, uh, but the homeless providers, that is the care providers, they estimate at any given time, Albuquerque does have a, upwards of 5,000 active homeless. The question is, which figures do you believe? Now the point in time figures reveal that of the 2,000 roughly homeless that they were able to identify, 70% of those people are in fact taking advantage of government uh, availability of, of programs, uh, whether it be the temporary housing or, or vouchers or, or what have you. But roughly 450 to 500 uh, is the number that uh, don't want any help. And the reality of it is you have to, uh, the reality of it is there's a certain percentage of the homeless that don't want help. They don't want government interference. They don't want to be uh, uh, involved with their families. Uh, they sure do not, they want to be able to live the way they live, where they want to live. Then there's an issue as to what extent are they involved with drugs and, and mental illness. 
So I, I hope that answered your question, Roy, but to me, the, the figure is about 400, 450 to 500 of the, uh, of, the, of the hardcore homeless that really do not want any sort of services. These are the ones that are wanting to camp where they want uh, for as long as they want and really do not want any sort of, as a result, they're going to the parks, for example, uh, and starting to camp there. It's becoming a bigger problem, uh, a lot of it because they're becoming so, uh, uh, so brazen in what they're doing. And the real question is, at what point does the city step in and say, okay, we need to put our foot down, and if you're not willing to take our services, then you need to move on. Yeah. So we have yeah. one question. We have one sure. question, Pete. Um, Gerald would like to know, has any of these camp locations been revealed yet, specifically in the Northeast Area Command? Well, yes. In fact, uh, uh, they're popping up all the time. I, uh, there was one that was identified at Jerry Klein Park at the end of the park. The, but uh, of the, I think what he's asking is of the, um, the safe outdoor spaces, have they been identified on a map somewhere so that there, we could see where they are in the Northeast area? Yes, there is a map and it's of the entire city and there's a large corridor uh, and it represents roughly 15% of the city of industrial areas and open space areas that could qualify for a safe outdoor space. I would encourage you to go to uh, one of my blog, or, uh, I've written a lot of blog articles on it, but there's an actual link that the uh, uh, planning department came up with a map that showed a definite area. Uh, it's uh, in, in, I think last week I wrote three articles on the issue and there is an actual link. If you go to www.ptonelli.com, I'll repeat that, www.ptonelli.com, it gives you a map that you can click on and actually examine. Uh, go to the blog and in the upper right hand corner, there's a search engine. And just type in uh, safe outdoor spaces or homeless encampments and uh, it'll list all the actual articles. And uh, I think it was an article that I wrote uh, last Tuesday, Tuesday okay. or Wednesday. Thank you. Willie, did you have a question? I see your hand up. Yeah, I have a couple of questions for you, Pete. One. Uh, in relation to your just last comment, uh, when you were talking about the police department, uh, the Albuquerque city needs to put their foot down and say, just move on. The question is, where do people move on to? Uh, you know, it, um, uh, what, what they do now is they move on from one, uh, uh, you know, in our neighborhood, they move from near the oil, they also golf course to um, uh, along the bike path. Um, so, uh, so on the other hand, if you could give them, and I agree, there are a significant number which won't do, I, but I'm curious as to how the city saying move on is going to have any help, particularly why is that a solution? The, the city has options. We have the West side shelter. Uh, they could camp there if they wanted to. The city is trying to open the Gibson Loveless. Mm -hmm. They could open, they could, uh, okay, I think there's probably areas out there. Uh, you just can't allow them to camp where they want, when they want, and how they want. Uh, that is ignoring. What bothered me the most is that the Albuquerque Police Department actually issued a uh, special order. And I don't know if you're aware of this, and if, I, if you are, I'll, I'll stop. But the uh, Albuquerque Police Department back in April issued a special order instructing their police officers that they were not to make any arrests of anybody at, uh, in, in, in uh, camping at the parks. And they were to allow the, uh, uh, the uh, family community services to step in and the uh, uh, Albuquerque Community Safety Department to step in to go out there and give them a three day notice to vacate. Mm -hmm. And that then only when they made the decision could the Albuquerque Police Department go in and force them to move on. Yep. Uh, that was a major mistake. Uh, and uh, they withdrew that order most recently because they recognize the only ones that can has the authority to tell to arrest would be the Albuquerque Police Department. 
-hmm. The other thing is they have the authority to issue citations and that could be done. But there are any number of options that are available to me as long as the city will be following the law as long as they have availability of locations of where they can go. And the city does in fact have uh, locations they, they have they can offer them uh, 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 they can offer them uh, uh, vouchers, for example, for temporary housing. Uh, they can refer them to any one of the 10 providers. Uh, if the churches want to take them in, they can do that. But to say that we, we're not going to arrest you and you just go ahead and go everywhere you want, you can't allow that. And that's why so, I say there comes a point where you have to make a definite decision. At what point do you say enough is enough? And, uh, and yeah, but arresting. Yeah, arresting them is putting them in jail is going to do what? No, it's, I'm not talking about necessarily giving them a choice. Move on. And if they don't uh -huh. want to move on, then you arrest them. And? And basically, uh, I think what you're going to wind up doing is releasing them almost immediately. Right. So, so I mean, so in, in that respect, uh, I, I'm afraid I don't see what the point is in that. I mean, it just increases the police frustration in a way by arresting got people it, and seeing them on, on the street again. So I, I you know, I- Well, you should have got it. Next time we come back, he'll know exactly what it is and where it's at. The other, the, it, the other question, which if I can remember it now, um, yeah, the, the other question is, is that we, we have, uh, and I don't know in the IDO, did they um, pass the, uh, another amendment having to do with um, what is considered appropriate housing, dealing with the, with the old motels they want to try to purchase, and just have a microwave and a heating plate and not a, a you know a, a full kitchen. And I don't do what what happened with uh, with that amendment. Do you know that that amendment passed? Okay, okay. So that so that will I mean the problem right now is we don't have enough housing to house everybody, and that's and that that will help that. That, that 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 problem, although some people are against it, um, to get people because I agree the solution is housing. I mean that's and how do you take people who don't want to be housed? That's a real problem, and that's and, and, and that's a tough tough issue. Well, what do you think? Well, let me ask you this: What do you think the option is if, if they don't want if they don't want to accept any services if they don't want to be housed? Should we just let them camp wherever they want? No, but I I, I I I don't. But I think, unfortunately, the the solution. Uh, I don't have a good solution. Uh, I think arresting them is not a solution. I think if you make it inconvenient enough for them, so they continue to to move on from place to place, that it may make them more willing to um, to go right. I ride my bike along the North Diversion Channel. Um, and you see now, see, I see several homeless um, people camp there. Actually, that's not a bad, <laughs> a bad place, actually, because, you know, it's not in public and it's, it's fairly quiet. Um, but so I, I, I think you make it somewhat inconvenient for them is, is what the best you can do, I think. And you just. So we do said, have, excuse me, we do have. Yeah, a couple, sure. We do have a yeah, couple thank of you. questions. But before yeah. I thank you, Pete. Well, um, you, you made my point that I pointed out. That is the goal. Make them as inconvenient. I've actually written that. Yeah. The goal is to make them as make it as inconvenient for them that they have to move on. I don't believe being homeless is not illegal. No. It's not a crime. No. But you can't allow them to violate or, or to commit crime. And there has to there's that fine line that 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 has to be drawn. Yeah. And, so I, I, Kathy, Kathy the homeless has, is not the answer in jail. Oh, excuse me. Kathy has a question um, about the um, the camps. So will the city be paying these property owners who they approve for their lots? If so, how much will they receive each month? No, they no, the city will under the under the uh, proposals, uh, what it is is that if you're an owner of land, vacant land, you would apply for a special use exception to put up a uh, to put up a a, a, a a safe open space area. And uh, what is interesting about that, there is no requirement of land ownership. 
In other words, if you own land and open space land, you can go ahead and apply for the special use and then rent it to whoever you want. The city, you don't pay, the city doesn't pay anything. This is up to the individual uh, property owners that would apply for these special uses. What is interesting is that Councillor Benton has said, this is a temporary solution that we're gonna, we're gonna try this and see what happens. He doesn't understand under the law, once, this, once you get your special use, it, 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 the term that is used is it runs with the land. And so it cannot be revoked, it becomes a, a, a property right. And uh, so once you apply and once you're given the special use, uh, it's yours. Uh, the only solution would be for the city to outlaw it totally. But that is not going to happen, I don't think. Okay, we have another question from Mike. He's saying, last Saturday, we wanted to use Bel Air Miramont's Park for a birthday party. We could not use the tables or gazebo area. We could not, as they were being used, um, we could not, as they were using the tables for beds, trash everywhere. I called the non-emergency number for three days with no help. A couple of years ago, the afternoon briefings were held at the park. Commander Weber, is this something that could be brought back? At the time, the homeless and drugs in our park was rampant and the briefings helped with that. Uh, good evening to everybody. Um, yeah, Bel Air Park is, is a challenge that we've dealt with um, really since I've been up here, even, even as an officer, um, we can cycle some briefings through there and we have done so. Um, I wanted, it's probably been about six months ago now, but they were cycling briefings through that park as well as the others. Um, it's not legal to camp at a city park currently. And, uh, and we do take action to get them out of there. The special order that Mr. Dinelli is referencing was an attempt, um, I guess, by the city to divide responsibility would be the best way for me to maybe phrase that is, um, you all know that Mayor Keller created the third public safety department, the ACS department. Um, and it was meant to address certain social calls that the police department was often the one who would be addressing in the absence of, of that department. And um, it's something, you know, two years ago amidst protests and so forth, many people were very much um, wanting to see something like this. And I, I think that the officers as well saw the need for, um, we, we would get calls all the time about, um, you know, this child um, is, needs glasses to function well in school and the parents are not buying them glasses. And we would, we would get that call routed to us as the police department. And, you know, we really don't, we don't have any authority <laughs> to deal with something. I'm asking an officer to go out, uh, the officers are trained to, to enforce the law, make arrests, you know, citations when appropriate, all of that stuff. We were asked to deal with things that were probably better handled by people who were, you know, had that aptitude for social work and, and those kinds of things. And we, we have a number of talented officers who, who adapted to that very well, but it's, it really wasn't our primary function. So um, kind of circling back to the encampments, I think that when ACS was created, the, the city really looked at it and family and community services and said, we, on many of these calls, these are social problems. These are not individuals who um, we need to be arresting. And I appreciate the questions raised by, by Willie um, during this discussion because they're, they're valid questions because I, I get that remark all the time. Well, can't the police just come out and arrest them? Yes in depending on the situation. Um, but the question is what happens when you arrest them? You know, do they, are they gonna take up housing in the jail? Well, no, the jail 
is going to um, release them almost as soon as we arrest them. Um, and so then the, where are they going to go when they get, uh, when they get released? They're going to go back and they're going to camp somewhere else. They might even go back to the same spot. Um, so the idea was to have a different approach, the social worker approach, the non-police approach. And the order was rescinded. It's being reworked. The, the mayor gave city legal a, a seven day deadline to rework that order and make it more clear for both the police and for ACS as to who, who should be responding to what types of calls, how do we triage them and go from there. So I, I do expect that they will issue something soon. And I think that it will provide us and, um, and ACS a little bit clearer guidance um, than, than what was there. So Troy has a question. Thank you, Commander. Um, it says, you stated it is not illegal to camp at city parks. But isn't there an ordinance that posts? No, I said it is illegal to camp at city park. If if I said not, I meant it is. It is illegal to camp. You can't camp. Okay. You cannot um, erect structures at a city park either. Okay, so you are in. So if there are camps like that, you are enforcing the ordinance. It, yes, it's it is okay. illegal to to camp in those parks now. How that, how that enforcement occurs again until uh, Friday afternoon, there was a specific order in place that said that family and community services would address it first. And then APD was more of a peacekeeper. Um, if individuals were getting violent or menacing with the uh, social work responders, then APD would step in. Um, I'm hopeful that in the next week or so, we're going to see some guidance on that. So Mike just wanted to let you know that the camp from last week, I believe that the Bel Air Park is still there an hour ago. So well, but I'm sure you it. probably you. know that. Yeah, I probably get, I don't know how many 311s um, on those and, and not to not to uh, make light of it because it's it, it's a huge problem. I mean, I, I live here too. I tell people that I live here too. Um, I don't like what I'm seeing. Uh, it's, it's a matter of, uh, we made the point one time at another meeting that there are more people camping in Coronado Park right now than I have officers working in the Northeast Area Command, most likely. So, I mean, I couldn't even go in there and arrest all of them if I wanted to. I don't even have enough officers or cars to arrest all of them. Um, so, so it is a, a social problem, I believe, that the solution is much bigger than the police department. And so Kelly asks, so... Would arrests not be heavily discouraged because of the McClendon settlement then? Um, McClendon it refers to arresting for petty misdemeanors and misdemeanors and in terms of, you know, can, is an arrest truly necessary, right. uh, you know, versus a lesser form like a citation or a summons or even right. mediation. Um, the other components of McClendon is you don't arrest someone simply because they don't have an address. And, and as someone had, had pointed out, and I would point out, yeah, it's not illegal to be homeless. We wouldn't arrest somebody for being homeless. Um, but there are times that we do have to arrest people um, because you tell them it's time to move on. You offer resources. They refuse to do so. If they're in an area that it's not allowed, then the next step is, okay, here's a citation. Um, if that's not going to work at some point, we, we have to physically, I mean, that's what an arrest is. We have to physically remove somebody from that location. Okay. And Marguerite's comment here is how do we know these aren't terrorist cells to overcome us? 18 designated areas, question mark, question mark. Yeah, that's not a, I don't know if that comment was for me. That's not, the one thing I need to be careful of a little bit, or I would ask you to, to consider is that much of the discussion tonight involves um, the policies of city council and our legislators. And I really just enforce whatever right. lawmakers <laughs> put on the right. books. And so those are right. debates for, for lawmakers. Right. Okay. Thank you, Commander. And, <clears throat> that's a good point, uh, Commander Weber. Uh, understand your position, um, certainly. Uh, Pete, um, if I understand correctly, I guess there's a deeper issue here and that is uh, uh, dealing with zoning laws uh, that, that 
you know, could carry on from council action. Um, and as you pointed out, I think um, if someone were to apply for uh, a permit, if they had open space and they applied for a permit to uh, have uh, one of these housing encampment areas, that uh, that that could stay there indefinitely. That's correct, unless they get rid of the entire permissive use, and uh, that's going to be difficult to do. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, that you that that bothers me is that the city council thinks that this is a generally a, uh, a solution to the problem of the homeless, and it's not. Uh, time after time, after they've done uh, they've, they've done in the, they've done research. Time after time, that research has shown that it's permanent housing that is the ultimate solution, and just allowing a space. To, to let them do what they want, it's not going to cut it. You have to get to the to those that actually truly need the social services, mentally ill especially, the addicted. Uh, it's that little group, that niche, uh, that, that that group of about uh, to me it's about five to six hundred that don't want any help, and uh, I don't know what the solution is. All I know is that the city is throwing millions of dollars at the problem, and yet it seems like the problem is getting bigger and bigger. Well, um, in, in, in fact, uh, didn't we just have a murder at yes. uh, Coronado Park. Park? Coronado Park had its fourth murder in the last three years. And uh, by the way, I want to commend and thank Commander Weber. I, I, I get nothing but positive feedback about you and the fine job you're doing. but. Uh, what bothered me bothers me the most about that special order. It basically essentially uh, relegated uh, police officers to be uh, to be uh, security guards or, for that matter, uh, public safety aides. Took too much authority away from you, and to me that that's dangerous. You have to let your office cut your officers loose to do their jobs, and. Uh, uh, I hope they do a better job with the next special order they come up with. So it might behoove us to uh, contact our city councilors and uh, ask them to give some deep thought to, uh, to well, this I, issue. I'm encouraging this organization to reach out to every one of the city councilors and tell them, reconsider the, uh, the EDU, vote no on these special outdoor spaces or these, uh, Safe, safe spaces, and uh, go back to the drawing board. Come up with, to me, there's there's a concept called the campus uh, campus uh, campus uh, uh, model, where they would actually build a, an interim facility. That's the goal of the uh, of the uh, Loveless Gibson Hospital area uh, of that uh, of that gateway shelter. But I think that uh, the city does have available lands that it owns. That they could actually build a, a, a complex uh, where they would provide housing for the homeless. Get away from these campsites. It's crazy. They don't work. And that's the only message that I'm trying to deliver. Well, thank you, Pete. Um, you've given us a lot to think about. Um, <clears throat> do we have any further questions in the chat or questions? Uh, uh, um, I, I do want to apologize, by the way, for if I sound a little choppy, I've got a really bad uh, sore throat uh, as a result of an inhaler I've been taking, and I, <clears throat> it causes a harsh, uh, harsh throat. No, uh, no more questions. No, no apologies necessary, Pete. Um, um, you sound just like uh, Frank Sinatra most of the time. So. Um, once again, I, I really thank you for coming and speaking this evening, uh, Pete. Um, and um, I look forward to reading your blog in the future. Again, that's at www.petrinelli.com. <laughs> thank you. Thank you again. Um, so you're welcome to stay and listen to the rest of our meeting, Pete, if you'd like. Uh, if you wish, you can leave wherever. I, I really do need to go. Uh, I, I've got a, a, I have to make a couple of phone calls before I hit the sack. So 
thank you all for inviting me. I really appreciate it. And Sergeant Sines and, and Commander Weber, thank you for your service to our community. Thanks a lot, Pete. Okay. okay. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to uh, APD's uh, presentations. Commander Weber, uh, the floor is yours. And thank you for attending this evening, Commander. As you oh, all my, do. <laughs> my pleasure. I, I think it was last month I, I had to skip out. I, oh. I had a previous engagement, but um, uh, I, and I, I sent you all. Did you want to put the numbers up, Roy, or uh, how did? Actually, you know what? I uh, Before I get started, we have a poll question. I want to put up uh, a poll question, and then, uh, then we'll uh, put, put your numbers up. And it's basically a uh, question is, how do you feel about having homeless encampments in your city council district? Um, and you have three choices, not happy about it, not concerned with it. Uh, we'll reserve judgment for now. So if all of our viewers could take a moment and respond to this poll, we would greatly appreciate uh, whatever input that uh, you can provide us right now. We'll leave the poll question up for a little bit. Uh, Kelly, once uh, can they still respond to the poll uh, once we take the question down? Yeah. Once the question is not on the screen anymore, uh, the poll is ended. Oh, okay. So we'll leave it up for a couple minutes here. Okay. Hopefully get some responses. Are they coming in in droves? Yeah, yeah. We have eight responses now. Uh, we can continue with Commander Weber if you'd like. Okay. Okay, Commander, I'm sorry to cut you off. Uh, the floor's back to you. So, sorry. No problem. So, um, did you, uh, you want to display the numbers? Do you just want us to talk about them? What's your preference? Um, Vicki, can, can you put the numbers up? Um, yeah, I'll need, um, I can try to share my screen here if, oh, okay. I, sorry, uh, I'm, I'm uh, as you all know, a technological idiot, uh, <laughs> or I, I would attempt it, but um, I, I might disconnect myself from the world. Some people would like that, but uh, I want to stick around for a little while. Yeah, so while she works on that, um, I guess what I'll start with was just to discuss the uh, last month I was informed that um, that you all wanted to see some of the uh, official vetted NIBRS numbers kind of in in conjunction with, with what we've been providing. And so just a brief summary, uh, we, we provide you with the CADS numbers um every month and i i do a three-month window uh from this year and then i do a three-month window that lines up with with the previous year as as everyone knows um but those are based on cads and and cads uh if if, if anyone in the audience doesn't know those are the calls that are actually dispatched out to police officers who then respond to them so um for example, an auto burglary CAD means that someone had called in and reported an auto burglary and the, the officer responded. Um, those numbers are not as accurate, obviously, as the official vetted numbers because the vetted numbers are the ones where now the officer has responded to that call that the citizen had called in about. They've done an investigation and it it maybe it was it maybe it doesn't qualify as an auto burglary although that's a fairly simple example but you know sometimes those get misreported by the citizen and then once we do the investigation it it turns out to be something else um particularly things like disturbances you'll see you know in may there was 663 disturbance calls well that 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 can be for a variety of different reasons not all of those calls are going to result in a report of some kind if they do result in a report of some kind, there could be any number of crimes that are on that report. 
Um, and so the official sort of vetted numbers that <clears throat> come out are actually based on the on the actual charges, on the crimes that that are reported, and that's what's reported to the FBI. That's what takes so long for us to kind of make sure it's it's right. Is that you've got to get all those reports in because it's going to the FBI. We have to ensure they're accurate. And and one of the things that comes up uh, as well is you can have a call, um, a disturbance, let's say, or a family fight where there's more than one charge. You know, you might have a, um, you, you might have a, <clears throat> a public affray charge, which is, you know, two people fighting in public. You might also have um, a, a battery. Maybe one of those people was hit and, and were charging battery. And so now you've got two crimes that are attached to one call. And so comparing the, the calls for service to the actual vetted CADs, um, I'm happy to provide the numbers uh, just for you to look at. I don't know, I don't know if it's going to be valuable to you or not. But we were asked to provide it, and I'm trying to make sure that we always give you what you want. Um, you know, the, the numbers are transparent. We don't we don't hide anything. Um, but you'll see when you look at the FBI numbers, what you'll see is, for example, um, like auto theft is a direct comparison, right? You have an auto theft call and you have an auto theft number. And what you see from May of 2021 is there were 89 auto theft CADs and there were 86 auto theft charges. So somewhere in there, we had three that we said didn't meet the criteria, but basically they line up. Um, robberies, you can see it's, it's um, a little more complex. Uh, homicides, obviously, you know, uh, tend to be fairly straightforward in terms of reporting. The um, where you're going to see issues comparing numbers is in like burglary, breaking and entering. The FBI has us combine those in the NIBRS reporting system. The problem is you can have a burglary without having a breaking and entering, or you can have a breaking and entering and no burglary. So when you combine them, it's hard to compare them across CADs. And so um, I hope that that makes sense. Um, but this is this is what I was able to to give you based off of what we have um, for this month, and, and it's something that we'll continue to refine as we have done, uh, as you all kind of tell us what it is you're you're looking for. And and I will also add, I've been out to APD's website and looked at the FBI NIBRS numbers, and there is a wealth of information out there. I mean, it's not just listing what they are. I mean, there's there's really a lot of in-depth investigation and data out there, and that's available on APD's website. So if anybody's interested in getting into the real, you know, the real numbers and really understanding the categories and the numbers, I would suggest they go to APD's website and look. And Commander Weber, since you and I were the one to talk about this is your explanation of the two, seeing the numbers is very helpful, um, you know, to so that it becomes <clears throat> a much clearer what the differences is, what the differences are and why the comparison of the two may be uh, difficult. I mean, I agree, auto theft and homicide is pretty clear. I mean, you steal an auto, you don't steal an auto. But, uh, but, but thank you for doing this and we'll see whether it's useful or not. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. Commander Weber for, uh, you know, do, taking the extra work and uh, breaking that out. It's uh, it's interesting how some of them track, you know, very closely uh, with CAD. Uh, one thing that I'm looking at are the calls for service. Um, that's a pretty hefty workload considering your, your uh, staffing levels. Yeah. Just wanted to make a comment on that. Is, is commercial burglary the same as shoplifting or does it have to reach a certain level of loss uh, to, to be commercial burglary? Um, well, neither one really. So shoplifting is obviously, you know, I, I go into the store, I, right. I take stuff, I take stuff out, right? It's more of a larceny type call or a theft. Okay. Um, co commercial okay. burglary is a category. So for a burglary, what you have to have is, is someone goes into a place that they're not supposed to be. So not like ah. a store um, and they take something. So this is uh, for a business, a commercial burglary would be um, in the middle of the night, I, I get in through a window and I take stuff out of the, the business. Okay, thank you. All right. 
Okay. Yeah, it's again, you can see that commercial burglary has gone up a little bit and auto theft went up a little bit at the, over the quarter, but other things went down. So this is, okay, thank you. Thank you, Commander Weber. I suppose we're now ready to go on to, uh, the re do you have uh, anything else to present for the Northeast Heights? Well, we did. Uh, I believe oh, Sergeant ahead. Sims Sergeant. was going to present the the force. I kind of stole his thunder on the CADS numbers because I wanted to explain <laughs> it. But um, then, I'm sure he doesn't mind. I, I, I doubt that he minds. Um, but if if uh, you are interested in the force data, yes. I believe yeah. he can provide that. And Please. Then, and then also, Commander, um, we wanted to find out about your community engagement plan and the progress you've been making on that. Would... Understood. Okay, thank you. All right, so for the, uh, the force data, so for last month, the Northeast had uh, two level ones, four level twos, and one level three for a total of seven. Um, in terms of the metric uh, force uh, per 1,000 calls, the Northeast was at 0.9. Um, the breakdown of those calls citywide, uh, disturbance accounted for seven calls for service, family dispute, six, Aggravated assault, a battery, five, wanted person, four, suspicious person in vehicles and a SWAT activation both counted for three. Hmm. Uh, commercial burglary, two, suicide, two, on-site suspicious or uh, suspicious vehicles, two, um, shoplifting, fire call, shots fired, residential burglary, child neglect, and vandalism all accounted for one. Okay. Do you have any questions about the force data? No. Um, I don't. Uh, do any of the other counselors? No, do we have any, I don't. Do we have any questions in the chat, Vicki? Uh, no, we don't, Roy. Okay. Um, did uh, You had mentioned uh, you were looking for something else from Commander Weber. Did I misunderstand that? Oh, well, we wanted to. I think it was maybe last year or November-ish timeframe, um, Commander Weber presented a community engagement um, plan that each of the area commands were putting together. And so I just wanted to ask him if he had any updates to that plan or um, if he wanted to share any accomplishments that they've made. Sure, thank you. Um... Yeah, I, I can't remember when I presented the plan. I want to say it was like January or February, but that could be, time goes by fast. So. Yeah, I don't remember. <laughs> I know, I don't remember either. <laughs> yeah, and there were there were basically, the, the plan is several pages long. It's it's a whole mission for, for the Northeast about how we, um, you know, what, what our mission is in terms of, of Public outreach, and then how how we see to uh, we're going to accomplish that. And so there's there were some goals with with outreach that were set, and then there's also some how we disperse information type goals. And so I'll, I'll work backwards the the information sharing, which has always been important to me to make sure that that we tell the public what it is that we're up to. Um, that that has been almost fully realized in terms of getting the information out. So we changed, when I started the, the newsletter was a quarterly newsletter and it, it had some, you know, the template at the time was basically to have some remarks from the commander, maybe a crime prevention tip, and then some, some CADS numbers or, you know, something of that nature. And there really wasn't a lot of what I would call useful information in it. And so th um, and it was, and it would only come out once a quarter. And so we've changed that to where it comes out every month. And it, the force data that Sergeant Sims just presented is contained in the newsletter. Um, the CADS numbers, not, not all of them, but, but ones that I think are significant, uh, we, we put in there for calls for service. We share the proactive work that the officers are doing in terms of how many traffic stops did they make. Um, how many field briefings did we have? Somebody mentioned, uh, you know, Bel Air Park. You know, how many how many field briefings did we have? Um, 
I've really strived to try to make sure that we share as much information as we can that the public might find useful. Um, we have, you know, since then adopted trying to get uh, and, and successfully the CPC now has a page dedicated uh, to, to you all to where you share what it is you want to share. Um, we've added a section now where we're introducing each of our teams of officers once a month um, and, and talking about you know, kind of personalizing it. These are your Northeast Area Command officers and throughout the year, if you read the newsletter every month, eventually you'll basically see all of their faces in that newsletter. And, and I just talked to um, uh, the person, uh, kind of our team that helps put it together. And we, we've we decided that maybe we should do that with our supervisors as well. So we'll introduce a team and then we'll also potentially introduce one of the watch commanders and talk about who they are and what they like and all that stuff. Um, just to humanize the, the, the contact because the, the community, the, the police department is made up of the community. And, and I always try to stress that um, with what we do. And so that has really been, been expanded. Um, we're, this wasn't my idea, but I'm, I'm going to use it. Um, we're going to start generating a, a QR code for the newsletter. So now it's, it's going through MailChimp, which is a much better software for managing contacts, um, allows people to subscribe, unsubscribe, you know, gives us an idea of, of what, you know, what is connecting with people and what isn't. Um, but we're going to start generating QR codes. And I'm not exactly sure how we're going to get them out yet. But the idea would be to have, um, you know, our, our local business partners kind of putting just the QR code up in their window or around their bulletin board. And, and the idea is then, then we're not asking anybody to print anything and we're not trying to distribute anything because I'm not a, not a newspaper distributor. So um, just having that QR code for people to connect um, if they want to. So um, in terms of you know, the out outreach portion of it, I met with uh, one of the churches last month uh, we shared with them kind of the vision that we start reaching out to more of the faith-based organizations. We've done a lot with businesses. We've done a lot with Neighborhood Watch. Um, but my next sort of uh, uh, frontier is the faith-based organizations. And, you know, because I think that that is a window into, you know, people who potentially won't go to a coffee with a cop or they won't come to a neighborhood meeting or for whatever reason. Um, you know, I really want to try to reach people who maybe don't trust the police department or feel marginalized by the police department. You know, how do we, how do we sort of set up that dialogue? And, and the way, you know, for me, the way forward with that maybe is is to go first to the churches um, for that outreach. So I met with a church last last month. Yeah, we're already in June, um, and you know, she. They're, they're going to share, a, they had a bunch of people sign up for a mailing list, which they're going to share with me. And they mentioned that they're going to pass that on to other, other churches. And so we're hopeful that we're going to start that, that process here. Um, we met with Dr. Rickman uh, last week uh, when, the, when they were in town. And, and people who don't know, um, Dr. Rickman is the member of the monitoring team who oversees our, our community engagement and, and our mission and that kind of thing. Um, and he is very, very happy with the progress that we're making. He, he did offer us some helpful suggestions on, on um, you know, potentially looking at youth programs and that kind of thing, how the police department can encourage those. And I'm certainly for that. Um, we, we talked earlier about, you know, kind of some of these things that are societal problems or societal challenges and, um, certainly having strong youth programs may help prevent some of the crime that we're seeing. So uh, all those things are, are exciting to me. Oh, I think you got frozen. Let me know what they are. Uh, okay. Thank you, Commander Weber. Um, I, I want to say that um, I, I want to commend you on, on your, especially on your newsletter, um, I, I think you're doing a great job and thank you for allowing us to have a space in your newsletter. Uh, the Council of Chairs um, is uh, planning, they're discussing now uh, creating a newsletter 
And um, I sort of was able to, uh, I don't, I'll just say one up them by uh, letting them know that we've uh, been uh, sharing uh, your newsletter uh, and uh, a lot of people were were surprised, um, and I, I just I think that that just shows the the strong tie between our community policing council and and your area command. Um, and I I always I always uh, laud the efforts of the Northeast Heights Area Command and the Northeast Heights uh, CPC. So. Thank you. Thank you for uh, allowing us to be a part of your newsletter. Thank you. Um, Kelly, can we show the results of, of our poll at this point? Didn't look good. I'm not <laughs> happy about it 100%. I'm not surprised by that. Nope. Thank you, Kelly, for throwing that together at the last minute. <laughs> I want you to. I want you all to know how nimble on his feet Kelly can be. Very. Thank you, Kelly. Um, do we have any uh, old business to discuss uh, amongst the council? Any new business? Roy, real quick, if I could, I did see there was someone had asked a question about um, how to subscribe to the newsletter, and I probably should have mentioned that. You can actually go to the, uh, if you Google Northeast Area Command, you know, Albuquerque Police Northeast Area Command, it'll take you to our website. And there is a link on the website. Um, one of the advantages of going to an updated system, um, there is a link that, that they can click and they can type in their email and it will, it will subscribe them. That's great. That's great. Uh, it sounds like you you're headed in the uh, definitely headed in the right direction. And uh, once again, thank you. You bet. Um, hearing hearing no uh, business before the council. Uh, I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. Willie, there it is. Yep. Second. So moved. Second. Uh, uh, Vicky, you have something? No, I was oh, seconding. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, Got the motion and a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye or all aye. 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 I, think aye. Was, I think it was a great meeting uh, tonight. We were able to have uh, uh, not one, but two speakers. So uh, I think we accomplished a lot tonight. And I'd like to once again thank the uh, viewing public that uh, uh, came out tonight. And uh, we are. Uh, going to be uh, hopefully having a, a hybrid meeting in July. Um, you know, Kelly, can you uh, give any input on where we stand with that? Uh, it doesn't look like it's going to be an issue. I talked to them and they said the debt is open at this point. So okay. All we have to do is reserve. Okay. Well, for will all that of you... At, will that be at North Domingo Baca? Yes. That's, that's where we wanted it, right? Yeah. Right. yeah. Okay. Great. So, so hopefully uh, some of you uh, viewing people will uh, feel like you want to come out to a meeting at North Domingo Paca. Uh, if you don't and um, you want to continue to view it on uh, Zoom, uh, you will have that capability. So with that, uh, I wish everybody a, a good rest of the week and uh, thank you for a good evening and a good meeting. Thank you, Thank Roy. you, Roy. Thank you, Roy. Great job, Roy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Kelly. Good night.